السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين <clears throat> so alhamdulillah we've made it this far and uh, with the tafsir of surah hujurat we had six sessions already and inshallah ta'ala tonight is our seventh and final uh, session on this chapter of the quran and um, well i'll talk about the quiz at, at, I, I know maybe 10 15 minutes into the talk more people join us so i'll leave that part a little bit later for a little bit later <clears throat> so we stopped at verse 13 uh, last time, and I said verse 14, 15, 16, 17. Uh, these, were all, these are all about one specific subject uh, or directed towards one specific group of people or anybody else with that same type of behavior. So that's why I said that we'll talk about these final five ayat in this last session together. So as we have seen already in Surah Hujurat, uh, in the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, told the believers and how to approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How you're supposed to refrain your own, uh, refrain from giving your own opinions over Allah's commands or the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's commands. Allah has addressed the believers in making sure that they don't raise their voices. They don't, of course, uh, none of us are living, none of us are living among the Prophet ﷺ, but what it means for us, as the companions have mentioned, that we don't put our voices over the sunnah of Rasulullah ﷺ. And then, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, addressed what is brotherhood in Islam for the next few ayat. And then last time, in the last session in part 6, we talked about the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically annihilates the concept of racism. That if you truly are a Muslim, there is no way you are going to be a racist slash nationalist slash tribalist. It just, Islam and racism or Islam and nationalism and tribalism just does not go together. It's a contradiction. Right, so we talked about that verse in verse 13 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed and told us that we're all from Bani Adam, we're all children of Adam and Hawa, how he put us into different nations and tribes, so that we can come together, get to know each other, learn about each other's lineage, and so on and so forth, and cooperate. Honor with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes with taqwa. All right, so now let's get to the final section of the surah tonight. In verse 14, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَإِنْ تُطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَا يَلِتْكُمْ مِنْ أَعْمَالِكُمْ شَيْئًا إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ The Bedouins, they say, we believe. Say to them, you do not believe. Rather, you should say that we have surrendered. For faith has not yet entered your hearts, but if you obey Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He will not decrease anything in reward for your deeds. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most forgiving, the most merciful. Abdullah ibn Abbas and a few other of the companions, radiallahu anhum, and of course their students, for example, among the famous mufassirun from the second generation, from the tabi'un, by the name of Mujahid, rahimahullah, and he was a student of Abdullah ibn Abbas. He also narrated this view from Abdullah ibn Abbas that this ayah or these following three, four ayat were revealed about or revealed regarding Banu Asad. They were a Bedouin tribe. And Bedouins are the people who live in the deserts, right? We, uh, we already talked about the Bedouins in the beginning of this surah how the Bedouins didn't have manners, how they didn't know how to talk with the Prophet ﷺ, and we covered them and hopefully you remember, right? So this, a few ver these few verses, again, towards the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed them regarding an action that a specific Bedouin tribe had done. So the people of Banu Asad, they're Muslims. Of course, they took the shahada, 
there's the story is that they had a drought and because of the drought they came to Medina and when they came to Medina they took the Shahada they accepted Islam and they were expecting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions to give them sadaqah, to give them charity. That they came to Medina, they are now your brothers and sisters, they're new Muslims, they've joined Islam, they're facing a drought. So they're expecting lots of charity from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions. So what they did was they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they claimed, they made a claim that we are at the level of the best ones. Who are the best of the Muslims? The Muhajirun, the people who migrated from Mecca. They experienced the torture that was occurring in Mecca in the early parts of the Nubuwa of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then they migrated to Medina with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They fought in the Battle of Badr. They fought in the Battle of Uhud, those early Muslims, right? So here comes Banu Asad. Years after all that, all those incidents and tortures were long gone, right? So Banu Asad now comes. We are Muslims just like the early ones. So they were claiming themselves to be at a higher level than what they really were. They're new Muslims. There's no way you can be the same as Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali, right? Uh, so this was the point. So then, now let's go to the ayah again. So Allah says, قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ amanna." This word A'rab, <coughs> A'rab means Bedouin. Arab is of course the Arab people, right? Arab are the Arabic people. A'rab are the Bedouins. This is what that word is. So قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ amanna." These Bedouins, they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they said, amanna." we believe. And Allah replies to them or tells the Prophet ﷺ to reply to them, قُلْ Say to them, لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا You do not believe. وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا You don't have iman. You don't believe yet. Rather, you should just say, we became Muslims. قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا We have surrendered. وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Because the true essence of Iman hasn't yet settled in your hearts. So don't claim to be from the Mu'minun. You're just a Muslim. You just became Muslim. You just surrendered. Right? قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a clear distinction. And this is, and, and pay attention brothers and sisters, because this is an important aqidah issue creedal issue for Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. For anyone who is a Sunni, this is an issue of Aqeedah, of your creed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly in this verse makes a distinction between Mu'minun and Muslimun. Because these Bedouins, they came and said, Amanna, we believe, we're from the Mu'minun. And Allah is shunning them. Lam tu'minu, you're not from the Mu'minun. وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا Rather say that you're just from the Muslims. There's a difference. In Islam, so let's summarize. In Islam, in the religion of Islam, in our religion, there are three levels to a person. The absolute basic level is a Muslim. A man or woman takes a shahada, he or she is now Muslim. A man or woman raised in a Muslim family, all what he or she does is pray five times a day, fast in Ramadan, sometimes uh, when, uh, gives charity, when zakat is due, will give zakat, right? The basic fundamentals, the absolute core obligations, that's what they're fulfilling. That's a Muslim. The Muslim can be praying five times a day and sinning as well because a lot of times what happens especially in our generation among young people among even elders they see somebody you know 
wearing a kufi with a beard, wearing a tobe, seeing him in the masjid five times a day. And then maybe he, tomorrow you see that in the news he's been arrested for some felony. And you think automatically, man, this guy's praying five times a day. How can he commit such a crime, public crime and defame Islam? And now everybody in the whole city knows and this and that. Because this guy is just a Muslim. Just a Muslim. Of course, Allah knows the reality of his heart. But at face value, we judge him as just a Muslim. Inside, if he's a munafiq or not, that's only known by Allah. But a Muslim, just a Muslim, is someone who at least prays five times a day. Right? Some people, they think that I pray five times a day. And it's like a big thing. No, that's the bare minimum. You're not entitled to anything if you just pray five times a day. And the way we have become the generation, the awam, the average person, our level of Islam has dropped so low that if somebody prays five times a day, we're going to think that man or woman is like a, an alim or alima because the average person doesn't pray five times a day. They think just coming to Jumu'ah, praying a Jumu'ah is like a big deal. That's, that's not even a level that exists in the religion, right? So a Muslim is the absolute lowest level. Someone who takes the shahada and just became Muslim. Or someone who's raised in a Muslim family, but all what he or she does is just pray five times a day, avoids acts of shirk, that's it. So this is level one. Then the second level is the level of a mu'min. Is a level of mu'min. And this is what Allah is addressing here. Lam tu'minu, walakin qulu aslamna. Don't say you are from the mu'minun. Say you are from the Muslims. So the mu'minun, who are they? <clears throat> they will do these basic obligations. They will also do extra. Right? And they will stay away from major sins. A believer, a mu'min, the, person, the people who are in the group of mu'minun, they will not fall into major sins. Then the third level, the highest level are the muhsinun. People of ihsan. So you have Islam. Then you have Iman, then you have Ihsan, the highest level. The Muhsinun are the people, even in secret, nobody is watching them. They still do not fall into sins. Even when they're completely by themselves. Why? Because they remember at all times, Allah can see them and Allah can hear them. So those even in seclusion, they don't fall into sin, they are from the Muhsinun. So these are the three different levels to our religion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly makes a distinction here between those levels. So let's say I'm going to give an example so you understand this better. Let's say the issue of, uh, uh, you know, the, let's say when we, we talk about hijab. Um, a woman may be praying five times a day. She's fasting in Ramadan, but she doesn't wear the hijab. Some people go to an extreme and say, oh, this woman, she does not wear hijab, she's a kafira. This is a major sin. You don't make takfir on a woman just because she doesn't wear the hijab. Does she pray? Yes, she does. She wears the hijab when she's in salah. After she's finished with salah, she takes her hijab off. Anytime she visits the masjid, she wears the hijab. She's out of the masjid, she takes her hijab off. This is just a Muslim. She's not a mu'mina, nor is she a muhsina. She's just a Muslimah. Why? Because Allah said, Ya ayyuha nabi, qul li azwajik wa banatik wa nisa'il mu'mineen yudinina alayhinna min jalabi bihinna. O Prophet, this is the verse from Surah Ahzab. O Prophet, tell your wives, tell your daughters, and nisa'il mu'mineen. Allah didn't say nisa'il muslimin. No. Tell the women who have reached the level of a mu'min. What should they do? They should take the jilbab and cover their whole bodies. So that is an extra deed. And this is why you find a lot of women, they'll pray fast and everything. No, oh, I just can't get where the hijab, this, this, this. They look for all sorts of excuses. Because the iman in their heart has not yet reached the level of a mu'min. That's why they come up with all these excuses. Same thing with men. There are many things that a man uh, will not do until he reaches that level of a mu'min 
or better yet, a level of a muhsin, right? That is what we have to strive for. Allah has given us this life. You cannot be just satisfied being a Muslim. No, you have to be a mu'min. You have to be a muhsin. That's what you have to be. Whenever you look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves in the Qur'an, never will you find a verse where Allah says that indeed Allah loves just those who are basic doers. No, Allah, inna Allah yuhibbul muhsinin, muttaqeen. You know, Allah loves those who are muhsinun, those who have reached that highest level. So in order to earn the love of Allah, you have to strive and work hard and, uh, you know, work harder and harder and harder. It's a lifelong journey. You can never be satisfied with what you do. Right? Many, most Muslims today, they think they've done a great job. I pray five times a day. I expect Allah to shower me with money and this and that and everything. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. What are you doing? I pray five times a day. Anything else? No, I don't. This is not how it works. You have to work on yourself till the day you die. There's always room for improvement. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, <coughs> he said in a hadith that's collected in Abu Dawood, he said, أَعْطَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ رِجَالًا وَلَمْ يُعْطِي رَجُلًا مِنْهُمْ شَيْئًا In one, one of the uh, situations after following a battle, the Prophet ﷺ was perhaps sharing the war booty or it was some other incident where he was giving certain things out to the people. <coughs> so Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu, he said that the Messenger ﷺ gave things out as, as forms of gifts. He gave to some people, but he did not give to one man among that group of people that was there in that gathering. Sa'ad then said, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a'atayta fulanan wa fulanan wa lam tu'ati fulanan shay'an wa huwa mu'min. I see that you gave so and so and you gave so and so and you gave so and so. However, you did not give anything to so and so. Wa huwa mu'min and he is a believer. Faqala al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet heard this from Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and he replied to Sa'ad. Sa'ad says, you gave to everybody, but you didn't give to so-and-so. Wahua mu'min, and he's a mu'min. The Prophet replied to him, aw Muslim. Sa'ad said, he's a believer. The Prophet said, or he's just a Muslim. Hatta a'adaha sa'adun thalatha. And three times, Sa'ad said the same thing. You gave to so-and-so, you gave to so-and-so, but you didn't give to him. Wahua mu'min. Wahua mu'min, wahua mu'min, saying this three times. And each time when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul, aw Muslim, each time the Prophet replied to Sa'ad, or he's just a Muslim. Thumma qala Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then the Prophet explained, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inni u'ati rijalan wa ada'u man huwa ahabu ilayya minhum. I gave to some people. And I left one of them who is more beloved to me than those who I actually gave things to. So the one I did not give anything to, he is actually more beloved to me than those who I actually gave stuff to. لا أعطيه شيئاً مخافة أن يكب في النار على وجوههم. I didn't give him anything because I am afraid if he gets it. He will fall straight into hell face first. Here the Prophet ﷺ also clearly makes a distinction between a mu'min and just a Muslim. This person, I love him. I want to save him from Jannah. I know his characteristic. This is what a true leader of a community is supposed to be like. You need to know who is strong and who is weak? Let's suppose there's a brother I put in charge. Hey, before every Friday, I want you to clean the minbar, make sure there's no dust and stuff. I stand here. I'm going to sit here. All right, he's doing it. Somebody else complains, hey, Imam, why did you give him this job? Why don't you let me clean the minbar for you? And I know that this guy, who's just a Muslim, if I let him clean the minbar, he's going to think he's another sheikh of the community. Do you understand this? 
When you see that men and women are like this, that if you give them something, they're going to become big-headed, you are supposed to refrain from giving them anything. That is Islam. Because you need to save your brother or sister's akhirah. People think, okay, I love this guy, so let me give him extra benefits. That's not our religion. That is an alien concept of nepotism that doesn't exist in Islam. In Islam, if you see a Muslim has a weak heart, if he gets something, he's going to become big-headed. You don't give him anything. The mu'min will know how to control himself. The mu'min will humbly accept his honor and he will do his job for the sake of Allah without becoming big-headed. That is the difference between just a Muslim and a mu'min and even better, a muhsin. Because there's different levels. So a lot of people will complain in a community that this guy, he's doing so many good things, he's this and that, why is he so arrogant? Because he's just a Muslim who did not deserve this position and because he doesn't know what to do with this position, now he's abusing the position. But a mu'min, he will know what to do with it. He's not going to become filled with ego, he is not going to become big-headed, he will not abuse his authority. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes that distinction. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes that distinction. You and I also have to make that distinction. It is what it is. My cousin, he's my favorite cousin, uh, he wants the, I know who my cousin is. If I give him something, he's going to become big-headed and he's going to think he's a big shot and he's going to walk around with his chest puffed up and then abuse other Muslims in the community. I'll tell my cousin, you don't deserve anything. I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to put you in charge of anything whatsoever. That is Islam. You need to save people from their own weaknesses. Because if people behave like this, they will fall face first into Jahannam. They're not going to be rewarded for their deeds. So self-praise is detested in Islam. This is the other point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another place in the Quran in Surah Ali Imran, لا تحسبن الذين يفرحون بما أتوا And never think that those who rejoice in what they have done وَيُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يُحْمَدُ بِمَا لَمْ يَفْعَلُوا And they love to be praised for things that they have not done فَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّهُمْ بِمَفَازَةٍ مِنَ الْعَذَابِ Do not think that they are safe from the punishment وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Indeed, a severe torment awaits these people. This is a severe, severe warning, brothers and sisters. These Bedouins came to the Prophet ﷺ, Yeah, we're from the Mu'minun, we're from the Mu'minun. You just took your shahada, calm down. You're not Abu Bakr, you're not Umar, you're not Uthman or Ali radiallahu anhum. Calm yourself down. You look what happens in the world today. That these people, they rejoice, as this ayah from Ali Imran related to this topic, right? يَفْرَحُونَ بِمَا أَتَوْ They rejoice. Hey, two years back I gave $5,000 to the masjid. Do you know, I come to the masjid five times a day. Yesterday I came all five times. Day before yesterday, day, last week I fasted Monday and Thursday. You are rejoicing over what you have done. This is not something to rejoice. Do you, can you guarantee that Allah has accepted what you have done? No, you can't. This is not the way of the believers. You don't boast about what you have done. And definitely you don't love what you have not done. Right? <laughs> this may sound funny, but Allah subhanAllah, this, this, may Allah protect us from such diseases. A person comes into the masjid, he shaved his head. We didn't see him for about a couple of weeks. Who knows, maybe he traveled, he got sick, something happens. Oh, mashallah, brother, you came from Umrah? Because, you know, he came with the head shaved. And he's smiling and he's, you know, blushing and getting red cheeks and stuff. That is what it is. Why are you quiet? Why are you smiling? Why is your cheeks turning red? You are supposed to tell the people, I did not go for Umrah. I was sick or I was traveling. I just shaved my head for no reason. But if you're sitting there smiling because people think that you have done Umrah, this is what you have done. You love that which you have not done. You love to be praised for that which you have not done. So these are serious issues that many Muslims are guilty of. Right? Many Muslims are guilty of. 
and they think that they are safe from the punishment of Allah, no, وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَلِيمٌ These people with this type of attitude, the severe punishment awaits them. In another ayah in the Qur'an, in Surah An-Najm, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not praise your own selves. هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ اتَّقَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows who are the people of taqwa. You don't have to come and say, I'm a muttaqi, I'm a muttaqi, I'm a really good Muslim, I'm a really great believer. Which is what the Bedouins did. So Allah immediately sent down a verse shunning them. This is not the attitude of a believer. To claim piety for yourself is itself impiety. Right? This is a contradiction. Because if someone really is a muttaqi, he is from the muttaqoon, he will be a humble person. He doesn't want his good deeds to be seen by people. And especially in this day and age, brothers and sisters, we live in a very corrupt generation. No one will believe anyone does anything good. Unless you take a picture and you put it on Facebook and you tweet it out and you put it on your Instagram and this, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. There are so many shuyukh in this world, brothers and sisters, ulama, that most of you don't even know their names, but they are dictionaries of the religion and they are producing thousands of students in their lifetime you never see them giving money to the poor however in the western world <gasps> Sheikh Fulan do you know look at the pictures he's carrying the bags for the Syrian orphans oh my god we hope that the Sheikh is sincere I'm not doubting his sincerity I'm criticizing the people's reaction why do you have to see a picture of the sheikh carrying a bag and then you'll think that he is the biggest charity giver in the world. When did charity become something to take pictures and show the whole world? Or you find what's going on, people have a, they have their hand like this in front of the Kaaba and then they're smiling, take a picture of me, telling his family, I'm making dua in front of the Kaaba. I mean, what, what is wrong with you? Just like the Bedouins of Banu Asad. You're there at the Kaaba, cry. You might never see the Kaaba again in your lifetime. Make sincere dua. Don't show off to the people, look how much of a believer I am. Here I am in the Kaaba making dua. This is what Banu Asad was guilty of. And Allah immediately sent down few verses, not just one. Do not do this. You look at these people, these lunatics, these Khawarij people of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, right? When they were doing research, I don't know, some, for some reason because of COVID, I think even ISIS is afraid of COVID, right? <laughs> you don't hear of ISIS for a while, ever since the COVID outbreak throughout the world. But before that, who were the soldiers of ISIS? Most of them were European converts or young Muslims who never practiced Islam in their lifetime all of a sudden they have an awakening. Oh, I, I got to start praying. So yesterday they were kuffar. Today they took their shahada. Tomorrow they go for jihad. They want to blow people up. Wow. So all the things in between of Islam you, you, you don't care about? That is literally who these khawarij are. Look at these young girls uh, in England, in America over the past few years. They go to Facebook fall in love with some guy and the guy convinces her or them to fly out from America and leave England, this Western life that their parents are raising. She doesn't even wear hijab. She's 14 years old, never wore hijab in her life, doesn't pray. All of a sudden, meets some guy on Facebook, convinces her, okay, I just started praying today. Tomorrow I'm going to buy myself a ticket and I'm going to go to Iraq and do jihad. Who are you? Allah doesn't need you. You don't even know the religion. You just... I mean, subhanAllah, every single person of these terrorist groups, you will see that this is their history. Somebody, uh, I remember, I think he died, you know, he's between, uh, may Allah, Allah knows best what his fate is, but he was the, they used to call him the Egyptian sheikh, I, for, I don't remember his name, and even if I did, I'm not going to mention it, uh, from England, the one-eyed, the one-armed, and I used to think, is he one-legged too, like a pirate? with a parrot on his shoulder. But anyways, Qadr Allah, this is what happened. He used to be a nightclub bouncer. Then all of a sudden he has an awakening and he becomes the sheikh of jihad in England. And he's convincing British youth to go and blow themselves up. Why are you here in England then, enjoying the Western 
English welfare system and this and that. Why don't you go blow yourself up first? Why are you brainwashing 12-year-olds and 15-year-olds and 20-year-olds to do this? Because it's fake. It's a lie. These are liars. So you have to be very cautious. Look at the history of these type of people, these type of speakers. Yesterday, they're bouncers. Yesterday, they're dancing in the nightclub. And then today, all of a sudden, they find out Islam and then they want to make jihad, blow everything up, the whole world. And they think this will take them to Jannah. Exaggerations and lies. Deception from shaitan. So you have to be very careful when it comes to these claiming a position that you don't have, a status that you don't have. In a hadith in Abu Dawood, also another hadith in Abu Dawood, <coughs> once a person came to Uthman radiallahu anhu <coughs> when he was the Khalifa. And he was praising Uthman and praising Uthman and praising him. فَأَخَذَ الْمِقْدَادُ بْنُ الْأَسْوَدِ تُرَابًا فَحَثَى, فحثى فِي وَجْهِهِ The other Sahabi, Al-Miqdad bin Aswad, he was present at that gathering. He took some dust and threw it at his mouth, at his face. وقال, and then he said to the gathering, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا لَقِيتُمُ الْمَدَّاحِينَ فَحْشُوا فِي وُجُوهِهِ هِمُ التراب. When you meet people who are praising you on your face, take the dust and throw it at them. Because they are here to destroy you. This is what people do. They, because what does praising, let's say somebody praises you and praises you, you become big-headed. You become big-headed. Yeah, 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 I'm the big shot. It's like, oh brother, if you don't vacuum the masjid, no one but you can vacuum the masjid. And this guy will start thinking he's the king of vacuum cleaners. I don't know, man. If you don't vacuum Allah's house, somebody else will do it for you. People have hands, people have legs who are coming here, alhamdulillah. The smallest of things make them big-headed. Right? So don't praise people, especially those who are weak. And if you are praised, as Imam Bukhari collected in his book, Al-Adab Al-Mufrad, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and other companions, they taught us from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if somebody comes and praises you in front of your face, you're supposed to say, Allahumma la tu'akhidni bima yaqulun. O oh Allah, do not hold me accountable for what they say. Waghfirli ma la ya'lamun. And forgive me for what they don't know about me. Waj'alni khayran mimma yadhunnun and make me better from what they actually think about me. What a beautiful dua if somebody ever praises you in your face. But the Muslims don't do this. Somebody praises you in your face, you become big and big and big and big and big and yeah, 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 yeah. tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. This is the way that will lead to destruction. As Muslims, we're supposed to praise people behind their backs. Criticism, we're supposed to do in front of their face. But we do the opposite. We praise them in front of their face, and the moment they turn around, we start backbiting them and gossiping them and, and doing namima and buhtan. And we already addressed that a few verses back, right, in this surah. So in front of one another's face, you're supposed to criticize one another. Talk openly. That's Islam. Put it on the table. If you do this, brothers and sisters, wallahi, try doing this. You will never have problems with other people. Openly talk about what you dislike in him or what he said. Hey, brother, you know, yesterday you said this to me. It kind of hurt my feelings. Be open. Get rid of that feeling immediately. Don't let it harbor in your heart and grow and grow and grow. But then you'll be like, Somebody's, somebody is robbing you. You're still praising him. Ah, you're such a good man. You're the best Muslim in the community. Oh, brother, without you, you know, we'd be suffering. We'd be all dead. And the moment he turns around, this khabith. Who brought him to this masjid? Who, we should throw him out of the town. That is haram for you to do. If somebody is doing bad things, you sit him down, tell him face to face. Praise people for their good behind their backs. If somebody happens to praise you, you say this dua. Allahumma la tu'akhidni bima yaqulun, waghfirli ma la ya'lamun, waj'alni khayran mimma yadhunnun. Oh Allah, do not hold me accountable for what they're saying. Because you know my secrets. And forgive me for what they don't really know about me. And make me better than what they actually say about me.
Right? That's what you're supposed to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, now before, before moving on to the next verse, not all types of praise is bad. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he said in the hadith that's collected in Sahih, uh, Sahih Muslim, قِيلَ لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, It was said to Allah's Messenger or asked, أَرَأَيْتَ الرَّجُلَ يَعْمَلُ الْعَمَلَ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ وَيَحْمَدُهُ النَّاسُ عَلَيْهِ what do you think of the person or what's your opinion about somebody? He does good deeds, then he gets praised by the people. People find out and people praise him a little bit. The Prophet ﷺ said, Tilka ajilu bushral mu'min. This is a fast track good news for a mu'min, for a believer. Right? So Allah already gives you some taste of the reward in this dunya. Let's face it, we're Bani Adam. If people motivate us, people say uh, kind things here and there, we feel good about it. This is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us. So if let's suppose you did something in secret without boasting and this and that, Allah willed for people to find out and then they come and say, Jazakallahu khair, barakallahu feek, uh, you know, may Allah bless you and your family, right? Like th this is fine. This is something fine and this is insha'Allah uh, a good news from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while you're in this dunya. So understand the difference. So never are you supposed to go and say, oh yeah, I'm a believer. I'm a strong believer. So I had this argument once, many years ago, this person. He doesn't pray, he doesn't fast, he doesn't do anything at all. Right? And he has the most Muslim name that you can think of. So I'm sure you can all guess what his name was. So he's arguing, I have lots of Iman. I believe in Allah much. And, and I was like, you never even pray. No, no, I have great iman. This is insanity. This is how many people are deceived by shaitan. What do you mean you have great iman? You can't even get yourself to bow down to the Lord that you supposedly love. You can't make a sajda to the Lord that who, ha who has created you and given everything around you and then you claim that you are a big believer in that Lord. No, this is kufr, this is ungratefulness. You're not grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then Allah explains, وَإِن تُطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَا يَلِتْكُمْ مِنْ أَعْمَالِكُمْ شَيْئًا So don't go and say, Amanna, we're from the Mu'minun. Just, you're a Muslim. You just took your shahada. You just became Muslim. You still have a lot to learn and practice. So Allah now says, If you obey Allah, and you obey the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لَا يَلِتْكُمْ مِنْ أَعْمَالِكُمْ شَيْئًا None of your deeds will be wasted. You will not have any decrease in the reward for your deeds. Don't worry, you're just a Muslim now, but that shouldn't discourage you. Work on yourself. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. These are the, the, these are the two conditions. You have to obey Allah, meaning what? Whatever's mentioned in the Quran, I follow it. You have to obey the Messenger, meaning what? Whatever is mentioned in the authentic Sunnah, I follow it. So you are able to do these two things, obedience to Allah and obedience to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa you will not find any decrease in reward. That's how you raise your level from just a Muslim to a Mu'min and then inshallah a Muhsin. Inna allaha ghafoorur rahim. Indeed Allah is the most forgiving, the most merciful. This is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever he shuns an action in any ayah, he will remind the people, all the people, all of mankind, about his attribute of mercy, about his attribute of forgiveness, about his attribute of accepting tawbah. This is a reminder. L listen, if you praise yourself, if you, are, if you think that you are of a higher level than what you really are, this is a sin in Islam. If you have done it, if you're guilty of it, check yourself, correct yourself, obey me, obey my messenger sallallahu alayhi wa properly. And if you are guilty, don't lose hope. Inna Allah ghafoorur rahim. Remember, I am the most forgiving, the most merciful. So rectify your life. Give up this way of thinking. Work hard. Actually work hard. Don't boast about yourself. And repent for this mistaken ideas and mistaken self-praise that you have. And you will be forgiven. So do not lose hope. Allah is calling to these sinners that just because you fell into sin, you should not lose hope. Inna Allah ghafoorur rahim. Rectify your life. Repent sincerely, give up this way of thinking and this way of living. Surely Allah will forgive you and have mercy on you. Then in verse 15, 
Allah says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا وَجَاهَدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ Further explanation, same incident, it's a continuation. Allah is explaining further who is a real mu'min. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Indeed, the true mu'min. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا The true believer, the one who has solid iman is the one who believes in Allah properly. The aqidah, you have to have the proper understanding of Allah. وَرَسُولِهِ And the proper understanding of the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا And then they have no doubts. If you have doubt, it means your iman is shaky. So the iman that you have in Allah and the Messenger, it has to be 100% solid. So what does it, let's say one example. <clears throat> Many people, they think Allah is everywhere. No, Allah has told us numerous times in the Quran where He is. He's above the creation. He's above time and space. All this is part of creation. Above everything, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa, for example, the most gracious, he rose over his throne in a manner that befits his majesty. And the throne is above everything, the seven heavens, the ocean, the kursi, above that is the Arsh, and above that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, completely separate from his creation. That's part of the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if somebody says, I don't know where Allah is, maybe He's here, maybe He's there, maybe He's up there, I don't know where He is. That means you have doubts about Allah. You cannot have doubts regarding your aqidah. That is this really right? Is this part of tawheed? Maybe it's okay to do a little bit of shirk in here and there. No. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا after that belief, they never have any doubts. You cannot doubt the aqidah of Islam, the belief system of Islam. You cannot doubt the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَجَاهَدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ And then they strive with their wealth and their lives in the path of Allah. So Allah is shunning these Bedouins. Are you going to ever be able to make the sacrifices that Abu Bakr made? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the one who took the journey with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when they were making the hijrah. How can anyone ever go beyond Abu Bakr? It's impossible. Or Umar radiallahu anhu, or Uthman or Ali radiallahu anhu. How can any woman go beyond Khadija radiallahu anha, or Aisha, or any of the Ummahatul Mu'mineen? Or his daughters, uh, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, Zainab, or Fatima, radiallahu uh, uh, anhum. Uh, so you have to think that these women companions made sacrifices. These companions, male companions, made certain sacrifices that no one ever, till the day of judgment, will ever be able to make. They were with the Prophet. ﷺ. They faced the boycott when the Meccan period. When they had to flee, and Abu Talib owned the valley, the Prophet, he gave some space to the Prophet and his companions. Children were starving. These companions' kids were starving from hunger. Couldn't they have said, you know what, you Muhammad, وسلم, I give up your religion. Because of you, I'm starving, my kids are starving. Even the women who were there during that boycott that the Quraysh made, they did not have any doubt whatsoever. No. We're crying from hunger. Our children are crying from hunger. This man is the messenger of Allah. We have no doubt. If we die in this state, we have Jannah. That's Iman. Without a shadow of a doubt, you have to believe Allah is real. The attributes of Allah is true. The deen of Islam is true. The messenger is true. His sunnah is the best guidance. You have to have 100% yaqeen. 100% belief in it. Without any doubt whatsoever. And you strive with your wealth and life. Ula'ika humu sadiqun. These are the truthful people. You don't just come, let's say, uh, let's explain us living here. Okay, I live next to the masjid, I go there for salah, I come back, I go for Jummah, that's it. Sometimes I listen to a lecture here and there, that's it. Do you contribute 
to the community? Nope. Yeah, actually I do. In what sense? I can complain. No one can complain like me. So that's how I contribute. That is, a, that is not what Allah is talking about. True believers, they will make jihad. They will strive with their wealth and their lives. You have to do something for Islam. You can't just live in this dunya for money. I got educated, I have a good job, and that's it. I'll just show up for salah, and that's it. I will not participate in anything whatsoever. That is the wrong idea to have. Every man, every woman in a Muslim community has to be involved in the improvement of the Muslim community. Every Muslim has to be involved financially or actually physically. I don't have money. Let's say, I'll give an example. Really, let's uh, give a minute example. All right, let's go back to the example of the vacuum cleaners. The masjid, all the vacuum cleaners are gone. We need to clean Allah's house. Um, I don't have the physical strength or the time, but I have the money. Here you go, buy yourself, buy the masjid for vacuum cleaners. Jazakallahu khair, brother. It's okay, he doesn't have the time to physically be here and do it, but he gave us the money to help Allah's house. Now another group of people will say, hey, I don't have the money to buy the vacuum cleaner. However, I can dedicate, uh, you know, uh, 20 minutes every day, come at, after Isha, I'll vacuum the masjid and leave. I'll pray Isha. I'll vacuum the whole masjid and I'll go home. I can do that. I can spare 20 minutes of my time. So you are now making jihad with yourself. So every Muslim individual in a community has to participate in the propagation of Islam, has to participate in the improvement of the community. You don't just sit back, right? Like some people, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, I, I mean, it is mind-boggling. It happened to me here, not once, twice, more than a dozen times. Sheikh, look at this dirty thing on here. Uh, look how dirty this carpet looks. This young management, you know, look at this. So I look at him, do you have two hands? I can see you have two hands and two feet. Why can't you walk using the two legs that Allah gave you? Grab the vacuum cleaner with the two hands that Allah gave you and vacuum this. Subhanallah. <laughs> What's wrong with you? No, I'm not going to do anything for Islam. I'm not going to do anything for Allah's house, but I will only complain. Islam does not need people like that. Allah doesn't want people. Allah has no need of anyone, actually. Right? That's the reality. And definitely not people who keep complaining, but they don't participate. And that's why the Muslims are suffering. We all have to be directly involved in the ummah. Me, I chose this life to learn the religion and teach whatever I know. Other people has to participate. They need to attend, they need to learn, and then apply them in our lives, both of us equally. The speaker has to apply them, the listener has to apply them. That's how you improve a Muslim community. So these Bedouins come and say, oh, we are the believers. What sacrifice did you make? You just became Muslim. They're, what about the people of Badr? What about the people of Uhud? What about all these people in the past nine years, ten years? who have been sacrificing alongside me so that you could hear the message today and then you became Muslim. Right? That's, that's what you have to understand. Every Muslim, brothers and sisters, especially us living in the non-Muslim land, you have to participate. Otherwise, you're just like Banu Asad. I'm a great Muslim. What have you done for Islam? Don't tell me you came here and you have a decent job, you opened a great business, you did this, you did this. It's all for yourself. Everything that you're saying is for yourself. But what have you done for the religion? What have you done for the religion? At the end of the day. That's how Allah will judge us. Those are the true mu'minun. They strive and they do things. They put forth things for Islam, for the ummah. They participate. Right? <clears throat> they are the truthful people. Like look at, uh, subhanAllah, we expect... Uh, and here, and this is one of the diseases here, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure people of, of this horrendous disease, right? You, you might think you're scared of COVID, but this is far, far worse than cancer. In most communities, the flourishing communities, you will see people will, uh, people will do things. Let's say uh, somebody is a mental health, health counselor. The person is not the imam or the sheikh. The person is not a hafiz. He's a Muslim 
from that community whose profession is a mental health counselor. He or she should volunteer some of their time for the community. That, hey, and is there any Muslim brother here who needs mental health counseling? Is there any sister who needs mental health counseling? This is my profession. I can help. I'm giving one example. That is how that person participates in the community. So every skill that Allah has blessed you with, you have to bring yourself to the table. What do you have to offer to the ummah? What can you do for the ummah, for this community? And we collect, this guy can do mental health. This guy, like especially now, subhanallah, right? Alhamdulillah, we have some good doctors in the community. Even before opening this, that, I talked to a few of them. Uh, brothers from the management talked to a few of them. When we reopen the masjid, what should we do? What, medically speaking? This is the time where we have to talk to our doctor, brothers and sisters in the community. That you guys are the ones who have the knowledge about diseases and infections. What is it do you suggest? Keep wearing the mask, wear the gloves, sanitize this, that. We got these medical fatawa, then we open the masjid. You can't, I, why will I go to a car man, mechanic and ask him, hey brother, we're gonna, you come to Juma. Uh, what do you say about reopening the masjid in this COVID crisis? No, I'm not going to go to him. He doesn't know anything about infections and diseases. I have to go to a doctor. Consult the brothers and sisters who are doctors in the community. That is how you go. Every Muslim has to participate. Right? This is, sadiqun. These are the truthful believers. They strive with their wealth. They strive with their lives. They strive with their skills. Fi sabilillah. In the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's now go to verse 16. قُلْ أَتُعَلِّمُونَ, قُلْ أتعلمون اللَّهَ بِدِينِكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٌ Still the continuation of the same topic. Allah is still shunning them. قُلْ أَتُعَلِّمُونَ اللَّهَ بِدِينِكُمْ Say to these Bedouins and everybody else who has the same mentality. Are you going to inform Allah about your religious commitment? That's what you think you're doing? You are telling the Prophet, Oh, we are believers. What do you think you're doing here? How can you tell Allah about your condition? Wallahu ya'lamu ma fi samawati wa ma fil ard. And Allah is the one who knows everything that is in the heavens and that is in the earth. Wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim. And indeed, Allah knows every single thing. So don't boast about your iman. You're not going to give Allah new information that He doesn't already know better than you know about yourself. So Allah is shunning these people, this mentality, right? <coughs> There's no way you can tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about your religious commitment. There's no need. Keep quiet, Allah will know. If you truly are sincere and you love Allah, you love the Messenger, you are striving for Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows. Your, all, your deeds are already being recorded. There's nothing new that you can tell Allah about yourself. So this encompasses all things, including what is in the heart uh, of uh, the iman in someone's heart, or disbelief, or nifaq, that he's hiding from the people, but Allah knows what's in the person's heart. Whether he's doing righteous deeds, he's doing righteous deeds in public, but then he's doing wicked deeds in secret. Allah knows all of that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows all of that, and he will repay people accordingly on the day of judgment. Those who have remained righteous in secret and in public, those who have iman inside and outside, they will have great reward. And those who have shakiness or wickedness and this and that, and we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from those behaviors, they will face the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point is, there is there's no need to even try. You're not going to give new information to Allah about yourself. So calm down. Whatever you are, Allah knows subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what matters. You don't need to tell people, ah, you know, I did this and nobody even knows. There are people like that. Like they'll wait around. Somebody might do something in the masjid overnight when nobody's here and he's intentionally waiting just to be seen when people come for fajr. Why are you still, what do you do? No, no, no. Let them see what I did all night long. You're not doing this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It should not matter to you who sees you and who doesn't. Did Allah see you? Of course, He is Al-Basir, He sees everything. There you go. That's what should satisfy you. If you focus like that, sometimes Allah will give you that good news already. Some person will find out some way, one, one way or another, without you trying, 
It's from Allah and they'll come and thank you. They'll come and do this and do that. Now let's go to verse 17. <coughs> Two more verses left, inshallah. يَمُنُّونَ عَلَيْكَ أَنْ أَسْلَمُوا قُلْ لَا تَمُنُّوا عَلَيَّ إِسْلَامَكُمْ بَلِ اللَّهُ يَمُنُّوا عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ هَدَاكُمْ لِلْإِيمَانِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ So continuation, same topic. Still shunning this type of mentality. They regard as a favor upon you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that they have embraced Islam. Say to them, do not count your Islam as a favor upon me. Rather, it is a favor by Allah upon you that he has guided you to the faith if you indeed are truthful. So this is talking about those, again, who claim to have faith, who claim to be of a higher level uh, and whatnot. And they claim that I have done this over the years and all these type of boasting. Either they are claiming to inform Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is what the previous verse addressed, or they are acting as if they're doing us a favor. Either they want to give information, maybe Allah doesn't know that I'm a good man, right? A'udhu billah. Or, listen, because I did this, it's a favor for Islam. It's a favor for this Muslim community. يَمُنُّونَ عَلَيْكَ أَنْ أَسْلَمُوا They talk to you, they come to you as if them becoming Muslim is a favor upon you. قُلْ لَا تَمُنُّ عَلَيَّ إِسْلَامَكُمْ Reply to these people, your Islam is not a favor upon me. You becoming Muslim is not a favor upon me. You starting to pray five times a day is not a favor on me. The sister starting to pray five times a day, starting to dress properly and this and that is not a favor upon anyone except her own self. بَلِ اللَّهُ يَمُنُّ عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ هَدَاكُمْ بِالْإِيمَانِ Rather, Allah is the one who has done favor upon you by guiding you to this faith. Allah did you a favor. You didn't do anyone any favor. Many Muslims, subhanAllah, they have this attitude. They, when they, they donate, when they do something, here. You know, they have this attitude, like you're doing a favor. I'll oh, see how you do things without me. You are not doing anybody a favor. If you stay quiet, if you stay sincere, and if you actually continue to do good deeds, you're only going to be favoring yourself. You're benefiting yourself. You're going to get the reward in the hereafter, not us. So don't destroy yourself by having an attitude as if you're doing us a favor. Right? Oh, we come to the masjid. Be happy about it. No, you're not doing anybody a favor by coming to the masjid. Keep coming to the masjid. Keep praying. Keep learning. Do yourself a favor. Cleanse your own self. Work hard to earn the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. What is the purpose of our life? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah ad dariyat crystal clear. No one can ever have any doubt about this. Why are we human beings on earth? Why did Allah create us? Why are we here? وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And I have not created the jinn and mankind except to worship me alone. This is our sole purpose of having life in this world. To worship Allah. That's why Allah gave us life. And what does Allah say in the next two verses? مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْكِ وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ I don't ask that they give me any provision or they feed me. إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الرَّزَّاقُ ذُو الْقُوَّةِ الْمَتِينَ Indeed, Allah is the one who provides and He is the owner of all power and He is the most strong. That's the purpose of life. I created people to worship me alone. That's it. Now you worshiping me, don't think you're doing me a favor. You're not feeding me. You're not providing for me. No. I'm the one who's providing you. I'm for you. I'm the one who has the power over you. I'm the one who's controlling you. You're doing it for yourself. You worship me so that you can have eternal paradise after death. Eternal happiness. Go back to where I created your father, Adam alayhi salam who was created in Jannah. So that's life. As a Muslim, you have to understand this. You're not doing anyone a favor by being a Muslim, by complaining, by doing this or that. Be part of the Muslim community by actually working for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the last and final ayah of the surah, in verse 18, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ غَيْبَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ 
والله بصير بما تعملون indeed Allah in Allah ya'lamu ghayb as-samawati wal ard indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the unseen in the heavens and the earth so what you do out in the open Allah knows don't think that Allah is unaware of what you do in secret so Allah reminds us in Allah ya'lamu ghayb as-samawati wal ard he knows everything that is unseen that is hidden as well in the heavens and the earth so there's no way you can hide from Allah what you actually do, what you actually believe in or don't believe in, what you say or don't say, what you do or don't do. You can't hide that from Allah. He knows every hidden detail in the heavens and the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says elsewhere in the Quran, <coughs> even to the point that, وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا Not even a leaf falls without his knowledge. Leaf that falls from the trees that we're always seeing. Every tree that every leaf that falls all over the world, Allah knows about it. Wala habbatin fi zulumati al ardi, wala ratbin, wala yabisin illa fi kitabin mubin. There is not a grain in the darkness of the earth, nor anything fresh or dry, except that it is written in a clear record. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. Your secrets, your uh uh you know, open deeds, your secret deeds, your open statements, your secret statements, everything. People sit in groups and plot and plan. Do they forget? They do. They forget that Allah can hear them and Allah can see what plotting that they're plotting against Islam or against a Muslim community. Allah knows this. Allah hears this. And that's why Allah says, Wallahu basirun bima ta'amalun. And Allah is the all seer of what you do. He can see every single thing that you're doing. There are no secrets with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He sees everything. So he is recording the deeds and he will report, repay every single individual after death in full as dictated by his encompassing mercy, his encompassing knowledge and wisdom, utmost wisdom. So this marks the end of the tafsir of Surah Hujurat, brothers and sisters. As we have clearly seen, uh, lots of benefit, like every other surah in the Qur'an, but specifically the topic of a Muslim community building, uh, the brotherhood of Islam, how you're supposed, your attitude with other Muslims, your attitude with Allah, the Prophet Wasallam, and truly how to build a Muslim community. Uh, if, if every Muslim community understood these 18 verses properly and practiced them, we will all be A-grade Muslim communities. Every masjid, every Islamic organization, every school, every, anything related to Islam would be perfect, the way the Sahaba were. But the problem is we don't understand these verses. Even if we do, we don't want to follow them. And that's why we see chaos after chaos, never-ending chaos within our Muslim communities. So hopefully those who attended and will listen, you can... Start the rectifying process first in your own self, in your own house, and then you work hard. Just because you might see problems in a community doesn't mean you go like a turtle, you just go inside your shell. No, we're not turtles. You came out of your shell, you decided to come out, you have to participate, you have to be involved. Ah, this guy's fighting with this guy, that lady's fighting with that lady. I'm out, Masalama. I don't want to be involved, I don't want to do anything, I pray, I fast, that's it. Uh, don't be like the Bedouins, you have to be like the Sahaba. Well, the Bedouins who became Muslim were also companions, but you know what I mean. The higher level companions. You have to participate, you have to be involved. If you run away every time you see something bad, then who's the winner? The bad. How do you stop the bad? By the good taking a stance, that this chaos needs to stop. We're here, you chaotic people, you need to stop. We're not going anywhere. That's how you stop the chaos. But if you see chaos and you run the other way, well, you're just giving open access to the chaos to grow and grow and grow. Right? <clears throat> so inshallah ta'ala, <coughs> by tomorrow, I will post the questions on the Masjid Facebook. And I'll also probably text it out to the community as well. So again, a reminder. The quiz that we're going to have, I'm going to send this out by tomorrow, which is Tuesday, and by Sunday night, midnight, okay? So Sunday midnight, you're all Cinderella's. 
<laughs> clock strikes midnight, your party's over. So uh, by midnight Sunday, you have to submit the answers. Sunday is the 10th of January. So I'll send out the questions tomorrow, which is the 5th of January, Tuesday. And I'll give you until Sunday to answer all the questions and submit them. Uh, inshallah ta'ala and once you said I'm trying to work it on the forms just like how we have uh, for the masjid registrations so that you just register and get submitted so I'm trying to hook it up in that sense it'll be easier so I'll just send the link click on it fill up the whole uh, you know answer all the questions to the best of your ability and again a reminder the prize is <coughs> the top four will inshallah receive fifty dollars each and again I would like to remind everybody to make sincere dua for the sister who sponsored this entire competition. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward her. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her marriage and uh, increase the love between her and her spouse, make them good Muslims. And also may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect her children upon Islam. All right, so let's look at the uh, questions insha'Allah. How many questions are there going to be for the competition? I don't know yet. Um, I don't know, anywhere between 15 or 20, inshallah. Uh, you know, it's not going to be too long. Maybe 15 or 20, inshallah. All right. Uh, should one follow the opinions of the local imam or from somewhere else? It depends on uh, what exactly is the issue. <coughs> I know a lot of people... Uh, cause themselves to get confused and this happens everywhere I can understand if you're part of a community or a, or a place you're in a place town community whatever may be the issue situation you don't have any imams you don't have any shiukh you don't have any tulabul ilm duat uh, you know teaching the religion that's a different story so you find people going online uh, searching through youtube lectures and things like that reading articles uh, going to fatwa sites and learning in that in that way, that's good. Uh, but if if Allah blesses any community or any locality that you also have local teachers, then you follow the traditional way of learning, which was always that you learn face to face with the teachers there. This way, you have more interaction. You can learn. Of course, this doesn't mean that every now and then you don't still keep watching some lectures here and there. That's all fine. Right? Because there's a purpose. Otherwise, there would be no purpose. No masjid, no center should have an imam or sheikh. What's the purpose? Everybody's learning from uh, everywhere else. There's still, you, you can't just cut off that system of education that Islam is founded upon, right? Starting with the Prophet. ﷺ. And this is what the ulama, past and present, they always advise. Now, when it comes to opinions, of course, in matters of aqidah, in matters of the established principles of the religion, we have no one, no human being has the right to give any opinion. Right? We just covered one of those verses in the beginning. You cannot put your own opinion above Allah and His Messenger. So, in terms of aqidah, the basic pillars of iman, among, uh, 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 <coughs> regarding the basic ob obligations of Islam, you can't have 10, 12, 15 different opinions. So if your local teacher, whoever, wherever you may be, is alhamdulillah, uh, you know, you're blessed enough, alhamdulillah, that you're learning from, by the book, you're learning the sunnah, you're learning the right aqidah as the Prophet Wasallam and the companions practiced, understood, uh, believed in, everything is fine, right? Then we come, that's, so that's one part. The aqidah, the basic principles of the religion, they don't change. It's not like, okay, this imam is saying that making sajda in front of a grave is shirk. I don't like it. I'm going to go to an imam that says I can make sujood in front of a grave. That's shirk. You can't pick and choose like this, right? Now, if Allah forbid you are in a locality where the imam is doing all these hanky-panky things and teaching you to do these hanky-panky things, then you have an excuse. Okay, you know what? I'm not going to listen to him. He's teaching me shirk. He's teaching me bid'ah. Let me go learn somewhere from online, from authentic sources, or let me move to a different city where there is authentic sources. Your Islam is very important. You have to go pl places where you can learn the religion properly. So aqidah, basic principles, this is one section. You can't have multiple opinions. Now we come to the second issue, is the issue of fiqh jurisprudence. 
There are many aspects of Islam in terms of fiqh, in terms of jurisprudence. There may be more than one opinion. Here is where the layman confuses himself. If you have an imam, you're part of a community where there is an established imam. Fiqh issues, he's telling you uh, to, let's say, one issue is a fiqh issue. Let me give you an example so everybody understands. Because people start thinking, oh, he's saying Allah is everywhere. Okay, that's okay, it's a different opinion. No, that's an aqidah issue. After coming up from ruku' sami Allahu liman hamida. There's one opinion that says, the majority opinion is that you put your hands to the side. You raise your hand, sami Allahu liman hamida, rabbana wa kalhamd, hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fi. As you're standing, you put your hands to the side, your two arms to the side. Then you say, you know, Allahu Akbar and go to sajda. There's another opinion that when you say, sami Allahu liman hamida, after that, as you're standing for that few seconds, you put your hands back on your chest because that is the position, the original position of your hands in salah. This is an ikhtilaf among the scholars of sunnah, right? So does it mean I'm going to fight over this? Oh, this imam is bad because he says this. Throw him aside. Now you are doing ghulur. This what you're doing is haram, right? So you have to understand what is a fiqh opinion and what isn't? Aqidah issues are not fiqh issues. So even then, to com- uh, keep the unity of a community, you follow the fiqh of opinion of your local imam. This is what the ulama have encouraged. Don't confuse yourself as a layman. Don't go confuse yourself because you don't have the enough knowledge to understand what is a legitimate fiqh difference or it's a, both opinions are strong or one opinion is weak and another opinion is okay, you don't have access to that in-depth knowledge of Islam. So when it comes to these issues, you take as part of that community, you follow your local imam. Otherwise, you're breaking the unity of that specific community. What's the imam there for? Okay, you you keep your opinion, I'm going to come here, I'll stand in a different way than you, and I'll break the jama'ah. I'll do something anti uh, the community. You are a fitna maker. Then you become a fitna maker and a divider and this and that, right? So when it comes to fiqh issues, follow your local imam's fiqh opinions. This is how you keep the unity of Islam. Aqidah issues, it doesn't matter w- what your imam is saying. There are no opinions when it comes to aqidah issues. You have to follow what Allah and His Messenger وسلم, have stated. So hopefully this is clear. Uh, see a follow up if I don't like a certain imam is it okay to not pray behind him so this is sort of connected Uh, it would be again a type of ghulur why don't you like the imam right you you have to understand in the sharia praying behind somebody (coughs) or not praying behind somebody has certain conditions this guy imam sheikh fulan I don't like his face, I don't like where he's from, I don't like that he is not my puppet, I don't like that he is not my uh, friend who comes to my house every day. Uh, Ridiculous reasonings, right? So I'm not going to pray behind him. This is a major sin in Islam. Major sin. You are separating away from the jama'ah. These are not excuses as to why you should not, you're allowed to pray, not pray behind an imam. If the imam commits shirk or severe bid'ah, then you have a shari reason that I cannot pray behind him. You have a religious reason. So let's say the imam is a grave worshipper. You're not allowed to pray behind that person. That's the sharia. You have a personal issue with the imam. You don't like how he talks or you don't like how he smiles. You don't like where he's from. This is you and your cousin, the shaitan, whispering, you shouldn't pray behind him. This is a major sin to behave that way, right? So you have to again understand. Or let's say there are some lazy imams I've seen, subhanAllah. Uh, let's say when they start salah, let's say it's not shirk but something else. Takbiratul ihram, the opening takbir. Without it, your salah is invalid. Your salah is invalid. You have to repeat your salah properly. 
Takbiratul Ihram is when you join the Salah, you're saying Allahu Akbar, right? You do this, you either raise the fingers to the level of the ears or uh, to the level of the shoulders. Both are fine uh, from the Sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ would change around. So you, uh, you say Allahu Akbar and then you join the Salah. This is Takbiratul Ihram. This is without it, it is invalid. I've seen some lazy Imams, you go, they're, they're doing this, they're just flicking their hands like this. Don't pray behind that Imam. What are you doing? This is Takbiratul Ihram. If you, if you don't do it, raise your hands up properly with some uh, you know, calmness and stuff, your salah is invalid. What are you doing? Right? There's like a lazy way, they just start the prayer. Just flicking their wrists. They don't even raise it to their stomach level. Right? So this is something that you have to talk to that person who's leading the salah that, hey brother, if you're going to start, or imam or whoever it is, if you lead the salah this way, this is an invalid situation. You're invalidating all your prayer, our prayer, because we're praying behind you. So something that invalidates the prayer, that is a reason. That he does, he's stubborn, he doesn't want to listen. I'm not going to pray behind him because what he is doing invalidates the salah itself. right? Or you have the bigger excuse is shirk. Severe bid'ah. Severe sh- like shirk. Then you, but anything less than that, it is haram for you to say, I don't want to pray behind this imam. Okay, then go to a different community. You cannot stay in a community and have this type of nonsense uh, disagreement because of personal issues, right? Or somebody might be saying, uh, let's give another issue and we can end with this. I don't see any. Okay, you know, everybody knows this guy's a fasik, but he's leading the salah. Don't pray behind a fasik. What is a fasik? He's stealing money, he's drinking alcohol, he's got girlfriends, uh, we've seen him playing in the casino, whatever it is, these are fisk. This person, multiple people ha- are eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses, they have proof that he is involved in these public fisk. Don't pray behind that person. Actually, he should not be leading the prayer. <laughs> You're not supposed to give people, that two type of people, a chance to lead the prayer. So these are shar'i, strictly shar'i based reasons I can see, right? Either shirk or some invalidating actions or he's involved in, uh, he's a fasik, he's a fasik, right? So you, you shouldn't do that. That's it. But other than that, don't pick and choose. Ah, I don't like this imam, ah, this, that. I don't like how he talks, where he's from, what he looks like. This is shaitani nature. <clears throat> so any other question? Let me see. Uh, no, I don't see any other questions. So we're not going to have any lecture Wednesday and Saturday. We will, inshallah, resume next Monday. So the next two lecture days, we're not going to have a lecture. And by tomorrow, inshallah, so keep an eye out. The questions will be posted on Facebook. And also, the link will be texted out to everybody in the community. Uh, and I'm sorry for the non-community members. You cannot participate. I mean, if you want to do the question, that's up to you. But... <laughs> Even if you get the top grade, you're not going to get a, uh, the prize. The prize is only for my uh, local community. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward everybody who attended and who are catching up with the lectures, who are listening. And most importantly, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us to practice what we have understood from these 18 verses in what true Islamic community is and true Islamic brotherhood is insha'Allah subhanak alhamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah